Merry Christmas from Rome. Today we bring the Christmas season to you from the Eternal City. Admire a collection of more than 100 nativity scenes from all over the world. Taste Rome's delicacy and Christmas candy in one of Rome's oldest bakeries. Learn about a new book by African Cardinal Robert Seurat and witness the resurrection of Christ on the big screen. Stay tuned for this Christmas special episode of Vaticano. On Gaudete Sunday, the third Sunday of Advent, Pope Francis spoke once more about the preaching of St. John the Baptist. From these warnings of John the Baptist, we understand what were the general trends of those who at that time held the power in various forms. Things have not changed much. However, no group of people is excluded from the path of conversion for salvation. Not even the tax collectors, considered sinners by definition, not even they are excluded from salvation. On the day of the opening of the Holy Year of Mercy, the facade and the dome of St. Peter's Basilica were illuminated with images portraying man's relation to nature, an event inspired by Pope Francis' recent encyclical Laudato Si. Titled Fiat Lux, let there be light, illuminating our common home. The hour-long display took place on the evening of December 8th. Set to coincide with both the launch of the Jubilee of Mercy and the COP21 Climate Change Summit in Paris, the Fiat Lux event was a product of the efforts of different humanitarian organizations. Despite some criticism as to the political and non-religious nature of images projected, onto one of the most emblematic Christian churches on earth, St. Peter's Basilica, organizers expressed hope that the images shown on St. Peter's Basilica will encourage people throughout the world to join a global movement to protect our common home. Four decades after its first edition, here in the Eternal City, an exhibition of over 100 nativity scenes is now on display. This year we celebrate our 40th anniversary, which coincides with the extraordinary Jubilee of Mercy. We have 177 nativity scenes on display, which come from 33 countries and 15 Italian regions. Every nativity scene represents practically the whole culture of the country of origin from the land or province it was made, and therefore they are very interesting. The exhibit, first created by Manalia's father, has now grown to house a wide variety of nativity depictions from all over the world. It doesn't just showcase the usual clay or wooden works, but each depiction is unique in its construction. The materials used range from normal wood, to a car engine, to even a nativity being made from pasta. Some made specifically for the exhibition this year, others for the archives. But it's not only a celebration of a variety of mediums, it's also a celebration of the great cultural diversity of the Catholic Church. Very diverse materials were used, not just pasta, silver paper, seashells, and also many other items which are of common and everyday use, obviously always while respecting the sacredness of the scene that is being created. And then there are those from Italy which come from an old tradition from the year 700, like the Neapolitan ones. There are really incredible nativity scenes from Naples with their old clothing. 700 figures, which are all very fascinating. This exhibit fits into the space of three rooms, but showcases the faith of an entire world. An exhibit relatively small, yet enormous in its devotion to Christ manifested in his birth. The UN Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination held its 88th session at the Palais Wilson in Geneva. 
to review anti-discrimination efforts undertaken by member states. The Holy See delegation presented its 16th to 23rd combined periodic report to the committee. They highlighted new supplementary norms of the Vatican City State, declared by Pope Francis in 2013 against racial discrimination. The legislation includes punishment of 5 to 10 years for those guilty of such crimes. Archbishop Tomasi drew attention to several aspects that are usually not very known, such as the important distinction between the Holy See, the Catholic Church and the Vatican City State. The Holy See is the government of the Catholic Church. The state is the tiny territory of the Vatican. And the Catholic Church is the community of all those who are baptized and believe in the doctrines of the Catholic Church. Another little-known fact is that over 50 million young people, the majority of whom are not Catholic, are educated in Catholic schools around the world. Archbishop Tomasi emphasized that through its schools and the well over 100,000 healthcare-related facilities worldwide, the Catholic Church, for centuries, has promoted the right of everyone. This is a testimony, is a witness of how the Catholic community really reaches out to the needs of people without taking into account accidents of race or birth or nationality or ethnic identity. During the convention, the Archbishop of Atlanta took the opportunity to submit his report to the committee. The report complains about discriminatory education funding practices in the United States, prohibiting parents from sending their children to the schools of their choice, including Catholic schools. Even though Catholic schools in the United States have a stellar record of the quality of education that they provide for children, especially children who may come from uh, a disadvantaged or a, a financially uh, distressed family background, uh, what the Catholic Church and our schools do, and do very well, is educate children and prepare them for life, prepare them for successful membership in society, and we do that uh, with the, the highest standards. Uh, the graduation rates of Catholic schools are exceptional. In his statement to the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, Archbishop Gregory stressed that the so-called Blaine Amendments violate the basic human right to school choice. And, and we believe that the United Nations has a right and an obligation to look into those circumstances in the United States where there are laws that prohibit free parental choice. The committee meetings this year marked the 50th anniversary of the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. All states' parties are obliged to submit every two years regular reports on how the rights are being implemented. This Christmas season in Rome, locals and pilgrims alike will be enjoying a classic Christmas lunch or dinner to celebrate the birth of baby Jesus. But if you're expecting meat on such a special night, you'll be surprised to find that many of the trattorias or restaurants in the city will be serving freshly caught fish, including this Vatican area trattoria with its unique history. We are located 200 meters from St. Peter's Basilica, along the Passetto di Borgo. This wall that you see connects or links St. Peter's to Castel San Angelo. It was used by various popes as an escape route when they sought refuge in Castel San Angelo during the sack of Rome in 1527 or when they feared being attacked or invaded. They would run along the Passetto or passage up top and would seek refuge in Castel San Angelo. The Romolo restaurant gives a glimpse of what happens in many Italian homes at Christmas, each dish lovingly prepared with one key ingredient. When visitors stop in for Christmas, they can expect all sorts of fresh fish. For us, we receive fresh fish daily. 
We will offer visitors simply yet savoring dishes of fish that will satisfy our guests, especially because of its freshness. And this is the secret to our kitchen. Our winning recipe is using the freshest ingredients all the time. Beginning with a starter dish of sautéed mussels, squid and shrimp, and moving on to two pasta dishes, one paired with clams, the other paired with fresh tuna, followed by a second dish of swordfish and lemon. The variety and aromas Italian cuisine is famous for. Together with a nice white wine and topped off with dessert. Feast? That's how they do it here. Quite the Italian smorgasbord for universal feast. All part of the Christmas tradition in the Eternal City. With the start of the year-long Jubilee, Rome's historical center is now catering to locals and pilgrims, well, jubilantly. Giolitti, a historic ice cream parlor in the heart of the city, is one local business geared up for the holy year. This is the Jubilee of Mercy. Not only should we be merciful, but we should extend this mercy to others by welcoming them. We will do our part to receive everyone who comes through our doors, just like Pope Francis has done to welcome everyone during this extraordinary jubilee in Rome. And the Christmas season is a particularly welcoming time in the Eternal City. This means the shop's legendary pastry chef, Alfredo Buffalo, better known as Billy, is rolling up his sleeves and stepping up the assembly line, bringing Christmassy sweets to the masses. Nativity-themed panettone, anyone? Baking both the Italian pandoro and the classic panettone is a tradition Billy took on years ago. I started working here when I was 14. I worked with the owner's grandfather, his father, and now his children. In 1967, I started making both, the Pondoro and the classic panettone, and other sweets, especially for Easter. Though many things have changed over the years, the simplicity of his recipe remains the same. He makes the pandoro with a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and a whole lot of heart, and lots and lots of butter. I love making gelato, but I also love making these classic recipes this time of year. I love doing this, and I love seeing people enjoy what I make. It's a personal satisfaction of mine. He leads by example in this kitchen, and with a history this rich and legendary pastry chef determined to deliver, it's little wonder why this gelateria has been around for more than a century, welcoming pilgrims and our Lord and Savior with sugar-sprinkled snow this time of year. Happy holidays from Rome! With the Pope opening the holy doors, the holy year of mercy has well begun. Across the Tiber, a bit further away from the Vatican, the church Santa Maria in Vallicella recalls an interesting figure of the city's history, St. Philip Neri. It was his church and the church of the Oratory of Rome. Its facade, facing the main street leading through Rome, brings to mind an ancient tradition. This church is connected to a lot of things. One of them is an ancient custom, which is really interesting, especially now, during the Year of Mercy and even with regards to the political situation in Europe. Since until the end of the Papal States, the churches of Rome had a special privilege, the privilege of church asylum. Every person that fled, persecuted and even criminals fleeing from the police had the rights to flee into a church and could not be chased by the infamous papal police, the spires. 
Philip Neri was famous for his sometimes eccentric ways in dealing with the sheep of his flock. Pippo Buono, Pippo Buono, that is Saint Philip Neri, liked to take this special privilege up. He liked to welcome the persecuted and the criminals. He led them into the church. Oftentimes, he waited for them at the entrance. He saw that they were being chased, so he let them in and stopped the police from coming in. It even says in the document of the police that the saint had a slight smirk on his face doing it. But Saint Philip Neri was not a person that just protected criminals. What he also did was feed them, he let them sleep there, but he also gave them a catechesis. He was actually pretty tough in that way. And sometimes the catechesis was so tough that one or two days later, the criminals went to the police and turned themselves in. This special love for criminals resounds in Pope Francis' care for convicted criminals in fulfilling this corporal work of mercy, visiting people in prison. Without God, we are nothing. These were the words of Cardinal Robert Sarah, Prefect of the Congregation for Divine Worship, during the presentation of his new and acclaimed book, God or Nothing. The book presentation took place in the library of the German church in Rome, Santa Maria dell'Anima. Like the title, the aim of the book is clear. I would like to help people to discover God in, the, in their life, because many of us have lost God. So through prayer and through uh, intensive life of reading the gospel, we can discover God. So my main point is how to make God return to God. It's not easy, but through our testimony, through our life, we can too help the people to go to God. Not only by reading my book, because it's not enough to read a book, but you, have to, you must have an experience. And through experience, through prayer, we can meet God, you know. So it's not uh, uh, enough to have a book, even a very good book. But what you need is to have a personal encounter, personal experience with God. So I think God and nothing will help people to encounter God through prayer and through his testimony. The African Cardinal made himself heard during the Synod for the Family past October, standing by the Church's teaching on marriage, rooted in Christ's teaching. His input was also rooted in a personal testimony as witness of Christ in times of persecution in his home country, Guinea, in Africa. Uh, we bishop in Africa, we try to very humbly to to help people who are looking after God, how to re succeed, to encounter Him through prayer, through fidelity to the magisterium, because the magisterium is the way who guide us to God. It's not a, a, only rules or something that uh, um, uh, is against our liberty, against our freedom, no. Uh, the, uh, the doctrine is, is the way of salvation, is the way of liberty, of freedom, and the way to Jesus. The book presentation happened only days before the Holy Year of Mercy commenced. One of the Pope's closest collaborators said that it is linked to the Jubilee directly. This book is very current because of two reasons. First, it is a kind of verimekum, a kind of traveler's guide in the Holy Year. It explains the meaning of the Gospel, the joy of the Gospel, but also the joy of faith. And it expresses this in a form that transmits enthusiasm, by a person who is a witness for all this with his own life. That is why you can suggest this book as travel guide for this holy year of mercy. As personal secretary also of Benedict XVI, Archbishop Genswein is a link between past and present Pope. The book, he said, illustrates the unity of the two men in white. 
This book is a connecting link between both popes and is a connecting link between the experience of the African Christians and believers in other parts of the world. Therefore, it is important that this book is being read, being taken seriously and is being put into practice. The book is available in its original French, English, German, Spanish and all other major languages. Would there be a Christian faith without an empty tomb? The Roman Empire. Risen is an upcoming American drama film. The film stars Joseph Fiennes, Tom Felton, Peter Firth and Cliff Curtis. Columbia Pictures will release this film on February 19, 2016. He was very special. EWTN and CNA spoke with Mikey Liddell, co-producer of the film, who came to Rome for the premiere. The story of Risen is um, at the time of the resurrection of Christ. And we actually took a different POV of that time. Instead of telling the story of the crucifixion and the resurrection in a typical biblical way, in the New Testament way, we decided to try to tell it from the Roman's point of view. So the story is from um, Clavius, who is a Roman soldier, a prefect at the time. And he is hearing about all that this is happening. And Pontius Pilate said, you need to find the body. And he said, what body? And he's just aware. He, he, so he, we really bring him in as a, um, somebody who's an outsider to this new movement. And then all he's really, it's really a detective story of him trying to find the body. As he tries to find the body and witnesses, you know, obviously the res resurrection and all that, it changes his life. So we think it's a great new way to tell a really old, beautiful, incredible story. When the Messiah comes, Rome! Will be nothing. The film takes a quote-unquote pagan's viewpoint to investigate the resurrection, that is, the essential event of Christ's death after his passion. His passion story had been brought to the big screen in 2004 by Mel Gibson and turned into blockbuster. Risen continues where the passion had left off and can therefore be considered a sequel. I would love to be considered that. I think that's a great thing. I think the passion was brilliantly made and uh, a beautiful film and perfect for when it came out. I think it changed, um, you know, faith-based films in general. Obviously, Mel and Jim and everyone who did that was doing it at a really, really high level and incredible cinematography and all that. And I hope we live up to that, that standard of what a great faith-based film like this can be. The storytelling attracts the viewer and leads him to think about what it means that Jesus Christ has resurrected. I think they will find their answer in the film, which is really, really important. And I think when you see the film, um, you know, our protagonist goes through a huge change in his life, as, as we all do, but in, in an extreme, in a short amount of time, he goes through saying, you know, asking people, is it a sprite, is it a goblin? You know, how ridiculous is this? Someone rose from the dead, you know? And he takes it and it's the question and that everybody's wanted to ask for, for centuries, you know? Really, did this really happen and all that? And it's so great because you get to see it from, his, from a detective point of view and he's asking all the right questions, but then he's asking, as he asks everyone, things are starting to happen to him. He's starting to see more things and he's, you know, he's hearing about the resurrection. He's hearing about that, that Yeshua was at this place or that place and he's starting to believe it until he finally sees it with his own eyes. And I think it's amazing. I, I think that's really incredible and I, I, I definitely think anybody who leaves, even, you know, the, the uh, Joe, Joe Fines, the main character, he doesn't go all the way, but it, you know, he has an incredible moment at the end where you can tell his life won't ever be the same. Where has he gone? You tell me. The film will come out February 19th in the USA and about a month later in Germany, Spain and the rest of the world. So we worked really hard to make sure that we told a story that just as a non-believer or Christian or faith-based in any way would, would go to see and just have a great time at the movie. If they got all of the things in there, that's a bonus and we think that's incredible. But uh, and I th I hopefully the movie accomplishes both that to um, both audiences and people who are just cinephiles who just love movies that it's really well directed and well made and so you can just go and enjoy it as a big almost tentpole movie in that way. I serve the Roman Empire. I fought wars against those who did not believe in our gods. 
but nothing could prepare me for the truth that has now risen. He was very special. They're fanatics. What was his name? He was called Yeshua. The man's dead. His followers are in hiding. He's been a threat. Take control out there and finish things. The tomb is sealed, guarded with your life. If this body vanishes, we have a potential messiah. Where has he gone? You tell me. You will track down the corpse of Yeshua. Right here. Open your heart and see.